Years ago, back when Craig and I lived in an apartment on Main Street, the hose that led to our washer started dripping a little. Not enough to notice. But Craig finished his laundry one e one on Wednesday evening, and the hose sat in the washer, dripping just a little, until by sat Saturday morning, the guy in the apartment below us came pounding on our door to find out where there was water uh, leaking from his ceiling. And we checked, and sure enough, in those two and a half days, the washer had finally filled and overflowed so that there was a puddle of water on the floor by the washer that had been seeping through to the apartment below. We, we mopped it up, of course, and we emptied the washer, but at first we couldn't figure out how it had gotten filled to overflowing. I mean, the water wasn't turned on, the washer wasn't on, and then we discovered it, a little drip, and then another, and then another, coming out of the hose. It wasn't, enough, wasn't much, just enough to cause several hundred dollars worth of damage to the apartment below us. In those two days and a half, those little drops of water did as much damage as 10 gallons would have been done, just poured out all at once in a couple of minutes. And that's the way it often is with evil in our lives. Now, I'm sure there are some people who seem to go suddenly bad and they make a dramatic change for the worse, but most of, it, most of us do it rather gradually. A drop here, a drop there, until, as the Dhammapada puts it, the water pot is eventually filled and the fool has become full of evil, even though he or she only gathers it a drop at a time. You know, when a government wants to get someone in a different country to be a spy for them, they usually start small. First, they ask their mark to get information for them that they don't need. You know, something trivial. A bit of information that's not even classified and is probably available in the public library. So the recruit doesn't feel that uh, he or she is betraying her country. And after the recruit gets used to little jobs like that, they ask him to get something a little more questionable, but just slightly. So all of an intelligence agency's early work with their potential informer <coughs> is merely an investment for the future. They don't need any of the information they ask for at the beginning. They just pay this person money to get it so that when the time comes to get something valuable, they will have paved the way. They understand human nature. You see, you can't get someone to do something totally against their values unless you gradually help them change their values. And I think the same thing is true in our ethical and spiritual life. Most of us don't go bad all at once. We start out small. Once you get used to the small stuff, you graduate to something a little bigger. Not very big, just a drop bigger than what you had been used to. Consider drug and alcohol addiction. Most people don't start out as full-blown addicts. At first, they're social drinkers or recreational drug users then heavy drinkers or users, problem drinkers or users. And when do you pass that invisible line between I have a problem with alcohol to I'm an alcoholic? Not everyone who's been there could say. They know that it got worse, and that at some point they realized they had to stop. But just when it was that they went from social drinker to problem drinker, or from problem drinker to alcoholic, they would be hard pressed to say. But that's the way most things are, isn't it? Trees don't grow all of a sudden. People don't get old overnight. Children don't learn to talk and read in a few days. And even when it looks like they did, if you look carefully, you'll see that the seeds that were sown for it were there long before they sprouted. The same is true, I believe, of our moral sensitivity. We grow or regress step by step. That's what the word gradually comes from, by the way. It comes from gradus, which is Latin for step, as in the steps on a stairway. Our word, uh, English word uh, graduate comes from the same root, step. And when you think about it, aren't graduations really gradual things? I know when you graduate from high school or college, it may be a dramatic event, but a graduation ceremony is really an arbitrary marking of a whole series of steps or grades or degrees of knowledge. 
Another funny word, degree. When you graduate from graduate school, they give you a degree. And degree also means step, as when we say I got used to it by degrees. Degree from the Latin de gradus, which is just de meaning down, uh, and gradus again, or step. De gradus, a step down. Another English word we get is degraded from de gradus. Now, when you think of degrade, <clears throat> you might think of something more large scale than the step-by-step -step process, but hardly anyone becomes totally degraded all at once. Degradation is also a gradual thing. And even when someone looks like they've gone down all at once, chances are they started stepping down long before, only no one noticed it because the steps were so small. Like the lights above us, they're completely off now. I started the sermon with them on, now they're out. If they'd gone off or on all at once like this, yeah. it'd be very obvious, but they didn't. Now, so probably most of you weren't aware they were changing. You may have noticed at some point that they were off, and you may have even had a vague recollection that they were on at one time, but you probably didn't see them change. There's an interesting experiment that has been done with frogs. Uh, if you have a bunch of frogs in water, I don't think they should have done this experiment, but anyway, it's just... <laughs> It's one of those things that um, biology teachers will tell you about. If, if you have frogs in water and you heat the water up very quickly, the frogs will jump out so that they won't burn up and die. But if you heat the water very gradually, they will not, no matter how hot it gets, because they never notice the change. It has to be a dramatic change. Human beings are smarter than frogs when it comes to water, but not when it comes to morality. If you heat up an ethical situation slowly, by degrees, most of us won't get out of the hot water we're in. In the last century, which witnessed the Holocaust, the murder of six million Jews, and before that, the million Armenians, people have often asked, how could they have allowed this to happen? That is, how could, how should the, how could the Germans have let it go that far? How could the Allies have let Hitler do what he did? And how come the Jews of Germany didn't just refuse to board trains to concentration camps? And if they couldn't do that, why didn't they at least leave Germany before it all came to pass? There was time to leave. The answer to these questions, and to most questions about degradation, is contained in the word degradation, gradus, steps. It all happened in steps. Sure, if the Jews in Germany had known their ultimate fate, they would probably all have left while they could get visas. But they didn't know that. They couldn't even have guessed it. And when the Jews were first ordered into concentration camps, they didn't know they were going to be exterminated there. They just thought they were going to be gathered there, which was actually only one step away from being gathered in city ghettos. It all happened in steps. In 1933, when Hitler came to power, 33,000 Jews left Germany in that year alone. But it decreased after that, partly because most Jews, most German Jews, thought it wouldn't get much worse. It did get worse, but only gradually. First, the Jews were expelled from the army and the civil service and the universities. Jewish professionals like doctors were at first prohibited only from service to non-Jews. Then they were prohibited from serving anyone. Then all Jews were excluded from citizenship and then they were told where they could live and where they could go when they were forced to yell, wear the yellow star to identify them. But there was always a pattern to this. First, the Nazis would attack Jewish people in some way and maybe attack again, but then they would pause and they would wait to see what world opinion would be. If it wasn't too strong against them, they'd go another step. If it was strongly negative, then they would retreat. Or maybe they'd do the same thing but more secretly. They always worked in steps. So if you wonder how the Nazis could have taken millions of people away to kill them, you must remember that they started off very differently. The first step was to forcibly sterilize all mentally disabled people to purify the German race of bad genes. The next step was to actually kill the mentally disabled children. But even this was done at first with only very disabled children. And it was done by just sedating them sedating them a little too much. 
It didn't seem quite like killing. Particular children were restless. One of the nurses was instructed to put luminol in their food to sedate them and help them to sleep. Seemed reasonable. And then putting in enough sedatives so that they wouldn't wake up didn't seem so different. It wasn't quite killing. And the step after that was to gather impaired adults, mostly from mental hospitals, and take them to centers equipped with carbon monoxide gas so they could be put out of their mis misery. And later on, when Jews and others were sent to concentration camps, it seemed a logical step to kill any of them who were mentally impaired or physically impaired. To put them out of their misery seemed more humane than making them drop dead of hunger or labor or illness. And once they were used to doing that, it was really not so difficult to just exterminate them all, healthy or not. They did have one problem at first, though. The people who had to kill the Jews were disturbed by it especially shooting women and children week after week. Not disturbed enough to stop, mind you, but disturbed enough to start having nightmares and sleepless nights and to start drinking excessively. So the authorities experimented with traveling vans that had carbon monoxide piped into the trucks. Then all you had to do was load people into the vans. You didn't kill them. The van did. The same was true with the gas chambers. They made it almost possible to feel you weren't actually killing anyone personally. You were one step removed, step by step. Now, in the concentration camp, someone had to make the decision as to who would live to work in the camp and who was too unhealthy to be useful, so would have to die. So making selections like this took some getting used to. They usually had a doctor do it, and one Nazi doctor explained it in an interview. When you see a selection for the first time, I'm not talking about only myself, I'm talking about even the most hardened SS people. You see how women and children are selected. And then you are sh so shocked, and that just cannot be described. And after a few weeks, one can become accustomed to it. And that change cannot be explained to anybody, but I think I can give you a kind of an impression of it. When you've gone into the slaughterhouse where animals are being slaughtered, a steak will probably not taste good to us afterward. But when you do that every day for two weeks, then your steak, again, tastes as good as before. One doctor who refused to do selections explained that he was just psychologically unable to. He said, I observed it and could stand it for only half an hour, and then I had to vomit. To which his colleague replied, well, that'll pass. It happens to everyone. Don't make such a fuss about it. For you see... Most were able to do it without making a fuss because we human beings can get used to almost anything if we're given enough time and if we're brought there in steps. And the reason I'm telling you this is twofold. I, I want us to understand the power of gradualness so we, we never mistakenly believe that we could never do what the Nazis did or that the Holocaust could never happen again. It is not so far removed from you and me, or rather it is not so removed that you and I couldn't reach it if we kept taking steps in that direction. Incidentally, I mentioned the Armenian Holocaust, uh, the genocide in 1915. They, this pamphlet that describes that has a very interesting quotation um, from Adolf Hitler. He said, I have given orders to my death units to exterminate without mercy or pity men, women, and children belonging to the Polish-speaking race. Only in this manner can we acquire the vital territory which we need. And after all, who remembers today the extermination of the Armenians? So he was very aware of that. He said, no big deal then. I can do this. But more importantly, I'm telling you this because I don't want you to ever mistakenly believe you were too far removed from people like Jesus or Buddha or Clara Barton or Mother Teresa to do the kinds of things they have done for the good of the world. You are not so far removed from them or from any other moral heroines or heroes you may have. The kind of loving, enlightened, divine human being you would like to be is only steps away from where you are now. You can gradually become that person. Gradually works both ways, you see. After the first service, um, one of you, one of the people who was at that service told me about, uh, she'd read a, a story, this is a true story, of a stockbroker who 
would take the train into New York uh, City, and, and uh, when he would get there, he always, there was a, an older black man who was polishing shoes, and he'd always have him polish his shoes. And he decided, since he did stock, you know, stockbroking work, <laughs> stockbroker work, uh, he he bought a share of something, not very expensive, maybe 50 cents a share, and he would just buy one share for this guy every day. And he, he went in, he worked there for you know about 20 or 30 years, uh, and every day he bought, for 50 cents or so, he bought a, another stock. And uh, when the, the guy who had polished his shoes was not able to do it anymore and had to retire, uh, the guy says, here's, here's an account of the, st- the money you have, and it was over a million dollars. But see, that little, any of the individual steps were not worth noticing. But in the village of Le Chambon in France, the people took in Jews and hid them during the Nazi occupation. But it was a very gradual thing. Uh, they first just started taking Jewish refugees in because they knew, uh, the, yeah, they just started taking Jewish refugees in before that they knew it was dangerous. And then when they realized it was dangerous, well, they'd already taken them in, so they just went the next step of protecting the Jews anyway. They started resisting the Nazis in small degrees. As Magda Trokme, one of the chief rescuers, explained, we started to disobey in very little ways. For example, in our school, it was suggested that we put a picture of Marshal Petain on the wall. We decided not to do it. It was a small disobedience, but then we started to be more disobedient. In the mornings, to give another example, the flag had to be put up in the front of the school and the children were supposed to salute it. We decided not to do it. More and more we would disobey. We had a habit of doing it. One day, finally, the governor came and said to my husband, now you must give the names of all the Jews that are here. It was at that time that the Jews had to put on the sign, the yellow star. And my husband said, no, I cannot. These Jews are my brothers. Jorge Voss, who was one of the people who saved dozens of Jews in Holland, described it this way. You started off storing a suitcase for a friend, and before you knew it, you were in over your head. One Jewish man who was a member of the French underground was on a deportation train to the camps when he jumped off and uh, while the, the train was rushing by, and he hurt himself rather seriously when he landed. Um, but a farmer found him by the side of the railroad tracks and took him home to care for him and hide him until the end of the war. Even though the farmer knew that he could be executed for treason if they found out he was harboring a resistance fighter, especially a Jewish one. Later on, after the war, the Jewish resistance fighter worked in various children's institutions and he remained a pretty religious person. So sometimes the children would ask him questions. And once they asked, what is an angel? We don't understand what an angel is because we've never seen one. And this man, thinking of the farmer who had saved his life, said, an angel is someone who, just when you think all is lost, when you think no one will ever help you, that nothing is possible, all of a sudden, an angel is someone who's there to help. A better theology of angels I have never heard. Folks, you and I are only steps away from being angels. Angel is a state of being you can get to by degree by steps, gradually. And don't worry too much if you don't get to see giant changes right away in your life or dramatic impact on the world by your deeds. As Reverend Gordon McKeeman once put it, you feel like a drop in the bucket? Well, who asked you to fill the bucket? Especially all alone. Persistence depends on patience, on keeping at it when there's little to reassure us. It would be too bad to give up, to sit back, bewone the starry, sorry state of the world and wonder why somebody, anybody, everybody, but not me, thank you, doesn't do something about it. After all, he says, the Grand Canyon was fashed by drops of water, as ordinary as they seem. Now, I can't presume to tell you what steps you should be taking to become the divine being you were meant to be. It could be giving a little more money to charity this year, and then maybe more the next, and so on. Or you may decide to spend more quality time with your children, or work on your relationship with your partner, 
or write more letters on social issues, or volunteer a few more hours a week, or decide to do three good deeds a day from now on. But whatever it is, decide to take that step. The Chinese proverb you heard earlier from the Tao Te Ching says, a journey of a thousand li begins with the first step. You decide to take that first step. It can be a small one. But once you've gotten used to that small one, try adding another drop or step, and then another, and keep going by grades, by gradus. You don't have to be degraded. Let yourself be upgraded. Or as another UU minister put it, and I will end with this, this is the Reverend Laurel Hallman. I sat in the restaurant by the window, eating my lunch and watching the construction project across the street. A cavernous hole had been dug to provide the foundation for a high-rise building. In the middle of the hole, a man on a single bulldozer was moving the mountain of dirt accumulated from the deep excavation. He started at the bottom, slowly pushing one scoopful up and over the top. Then he backed down and pushed another scoopful up, barely changing the outline of the dirt as he worked. That's wrong, I thought. Surely there must be a better way. But as I thought of alternatives, I couldn't find one. In the hour and a half that I sat there, he did slowly move the mountain of dirt, one scoop at a time, one trip at a time. It reminded me of the Christian scriptures which refer to faith so as to remove mountains. An extraordinary faith, I had always thought, powerful, even fierce. And yet as I watched as the man on the bulldozer moved his mountain of dirt, I realized that such a faith is more patient than powerful. It does the task at hand deliberately, consistently, with tenacity, as well as with vision. I admired that man, I wondered if he was religious and at the source of his patience, if it was his religion. I wondered if he knew how extraordinary his task seemed from across the street. I wonder if he knew how much his life gave witness to the truth that faith which can move mountains is lived daily in small portions in the midst of our lives, moving the mountain one small scoopful at a time.